Well, good evening. Good to be with you once again on this Wednesday evening as we continue our study in the book of Ecclesiastes. So I encourage you to turn there to the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to start in uh, chapter 1, verse 12, and go all the way through chapter 2. So let me go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity to be together around your word. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, to help us interpret these scriptures, to apply them to our life, to glorify you, and to walk closer to you. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, a couple of things just to begin with. First of all, if you did not watch last week's video, you need to go back and watch that. You're going to be lost if you don't, okay? So, and the second thing is, is that uh, uh, if you have children in the home, I encourage you to bring them in and be a part of this study. If you have small children, um, they may be a little bit over their heads, but this will give you opportunities and talking points to discuss with them. But I would say middle school or upper elementary and above, uh, I would encourage you, bring them in to be a part of this study. Here's the teacher, uh, Solomon, is gathering together the people of God and speaking wisdom into their life. And this is multi-generational things. There again, the, some of the things of Solomon that he gives in this book uh, are, are running on a higher level of understanding and uh, and also some sensitive topics, but we will uh, make sure those topics are discussed in an appropriate way. Okay, so don't be concerned about that. So I encourage you, there's a family, sit together and then discuss some of these things after the video. So uh, I encourage you to, to take part in that. All right. So remember, life under the sun, a life that is devoid of an active walk with God, life devoid of God it can be seen as those that are unbelievers, the lost or as believers who have become prodigals, who have left life with the father and have gone out on a journey, if you will. Uh, we call it sometimes backsliding in the Christian uh, circles. But here's trying to live life under the sun. Now, there again, uh, you don't have to necessarily be a backslidden uh, a prodigal. Uh, you can be a Christian who goes to church every Sunday, who uh, has a, a devotion every morning. But how are you living your life? Are you living your life with God in every aspect of your life, your job, your family, your finances, your friendships, your hobbies and everything? Or are you trying to find life under the sun uh, or live life under the sun and trying to find meaning and happiness and joy and fulfillment in a life devoid of God saturating every part of your life. So remember when he's talking about Solomon is speaking here, he's speaking from the point of view of life under the sun. If this was a, a movie uh, that was made, um, some of the things that you would see and we're going to see in the latter part of chapter two, it would be Solomon sitting there teaching. But when he goes into, as we read these verses, it's almost like if this was a movie, it would be a flashback to his life. In other words, that what you would see would be him living this life devoid of the relationship with God. Okay. And so we got to make sure that when we read these scriptures, because we can take offense to some of the things he says, or we can say, no, this isn't true. This isn't accurate. Remember, it's coming from the point of view of him living his life under the sun. Okay. So that's how we have to view the scripture. Um, people are looking for uh, enjoyment. They're looking for fulfillment. They're looking for meaning. We all are. That's how God designed us. Now, God designed us to find all those answers in him. So this passage that we're going to read is Solomon saying, here's what life looks like for those who are trying to find meaning and fulfillment and joy and happiness in a life that is devoid of God. And so that's how many people are living their life. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville was a Frenchman uh, in 1830 who came to the United States to tour the United States to see what this this uh, this new country was all about, right? And so he comes to the United States and he tours the U.S. And here was his conclusion. He says he observed a strange melancholy in the midst of abundance. So he sees America as this country of abundance. In the South, you have sprawling plantations and huge homes. And in the North, you have the railroad barons and the newspaper barons. And so you have all this abundance in New York and Boston and Philadelphia and Atlanta, all these places along the coast there that are just uh, as the world, uh, the United States is 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 going west and, and all these discoveries that were the, the United States was in a time of abundance. There was a lot of, of excess wealth and these things. And he says, what does he say? In the midst of all that abundance, the American people just have this strange melancholy, this strange depression, this strange emptiness in the midst of their abundance. Now that was true in 1830 and 
this is still true today. We're trying to find a uh, meaning and purpose in, in things of, of this life. And we have this abundance of technology. We have an abundance of time. So what do we do with our time? We fill our time with other things to try to find meaning or joy or purpose and happiness. All these things, if they're devoid of God, then they're just spinning their wheels. It's vanity. It's meaningless. It's a vapor, is what Solomon says. So here's what he's. That's the the, the conclusion that um, that de Tocqueville came to. C.S. Lewis uh, says it this way. He says, "If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world." Think about that, what Lewis is saying. He says, look, if, if I find in myself desires that are not satisfied in anything in this world, then I must be made for another world. He's true. He's, he's accurate in what he's saying there. See, God has never designed us to be happy and fulfilled and content in his creation. Now, he's given us his creation for our enjoyment and for our joy, but in and of itself, there's no contentment in those things. There's no meaning. There's no purpose in those things devoid of God. The God has never designed the creation to satisfy us. He has designed the creation to point to a creator. We can enjoy the creation God has given us when we have a proper relationship with the creator, right? Um, so that's the whole point of what, what God is doing in this creation. Hey, this creation is, is here. It's fallen. It's, it's scarred by sin. But here's the thing is that we are pilgrims in this world. Our, our ultimate destination is not this world. Our ultimate destination is life with God in heaven. That's where he wants us to be. Now, obviously, for those who are outside of God, their eternal life will be spent in a place called hell, right? You think this is bad? <laughs> Wait till you get there. That's the whole point, to be with him, that this nothing in this world will truly satisfy it's only God who satisfies. The ultimate satisfaction is found with him in eternity. Uh, outside of suffering and pain and all the things of this world, when we get to spend eternity with him. All right. So we need something beyond the sun. In other words, is what I'm saying. And that's what Solomon is saying as well. Well, today, kind of an outline, if you will, uh, we're going to see three causes for Solomon's despair and then one source of joy. Uh, Solomon does finally have some, some uh, positive things to say at the end of chapter two. And so we'll be sure and get to those. So three causes of his despair and then one source that he sees for his joy. For his first reason for despair is that wisdom does not satisfy. It's one of the conclusions he comes to. Wisdom does not satisfy. Look at verse 12. He says, I, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I've seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, a striving after the wind. So here he is. Solomon says, look, I gave it my best effort. He says, I, I applied my heart. There's the intensity in which he searched after meaning and purpose uh, and joy in, in wisdom. He says, not only that, I went to the every place under the sun, all the known world at that time, Egypt and Mesopotamia and Asia. He went all over the known world seeking out wisdom. And he was uh, using his wisdom to try to find meaning. The more wisdom, the more meaning, the more joy, right? That's what he assumed, but he found out, what does he say? It's a meaningless task. It's an unhappy business is what he said. So that's, you know, he says, it's not the ultimate fulfillment is not found in wisdom. Matter of fact, what does he say? Uh, go to verse 16. He says, I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. I perceive that this also is a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. What was he saying? Ignorance is bliss. Now remember, this is life under the sun as far as wisdom and knowledge devoid of God. Now obviously God is loves wisdom, right? God wants us to have wisdom, but he wants us to have his wisdom. He's given us wisdom literature in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Song of Solomon. These are all wisdom literature in the Bible. But remember, Solomon's talking about a wisdom devoid of God. 
Now then, here's one of the uh, a little side note I want to make um, uh, about wisdom and knowledge devoid of God. This is where I believe your children come into play is that um, uh, for, for kids, for your kids going to, to, to school, to the universities, uh, I believe we need to. And I, I'm, I'm uh, serious about this in, in my walk and in my, my children's walk is I really encourage you to, to look at Christian universities, at least for that first four years. Now then, uh, you know, to, to go on to your graduate and postgraduate work is, is, is something uh, that uh, your field may require outside of a Christian university. But those first four years are very formative years um, that where the universities look to try to rob you of a God-centered view. They try to bring your view of life under the sun. And other, again, I'm not throwing stones. I'm just talking about reality here. Uh, there's a lot of Christian universities. Matter of fact, our Southern Baptist Convention, which is made up of state conventions, most states and state conventions have a university which they either endorse or su su support or they started, they initiated or are still uh, undergoing. There's a lot of them out there. Florida has one, the Baptist College of Florida up in Graceville. You can go to that school. Yes, you can go for pastoral ministry, uh, missions, and music. And we, that's what we usually think of Christian universities. But you can also get a four-year business degree. You can get a teaching degree. Uh, you can get all kinds of different degrees. Now, BCF is a smaller school, so it is limited. I know in Mississippi, where our son is going to Southern Miss, which is a secular university, there's William Carey University that is... Uh, is, is run by the Southern Baptist uh, of Mississippi. And uh, there you can get all kinds of degrees uh, that are four-year degrees in all kinds of different fields. Yes, ministerial, but that's not, that's just one segment. Now there again, when you go to a Christian university, they come into the a mindset of in your business or nursing or education, whatever your degree is going to be, they bring it as a, as a, a view above the sun view of how do you view business as a Christian? How do you view nursing and sciences as a Christian? How do you view philosophy as a Christian? And how do you use that in the world in which we live? There again, it's not about just getting a pastoral or a missions degree. It's about seeing the worldview of God in all of life. I would encourage you, as, as you have students, to look into those Christian universities. There again, our son is going to Southern Miss, a secular university. He's studying sciences. He's studying biology. But his first couple of years he did, uh, for semesters anyway, was at a Southeastern Seminary where I went to school at the college there. And he studied philosophy. He studied uh, certain things, that those, especially those formative classes, uh, he studied in a Christian environment. I believe those are very important. Now, there again, as he's studying science uh, in the secular university, uh, he's coming to it from a Christian worldview. And here's one thing he's finding out is many of the professors in that secular Christian or secular uh, university, they're open to a, a God centered view um, because here's the thing is that in the sciences and where, where he is at, first of all, it's in, a, in Mississippi, which is more of a conservative state. But well, the other aspect is, is that the philosophy classes are what's used to change your worldview, not necessarily the science classes. So those, those early years, at least the first two years of an associate's degree, where you take philosophy, where you take literature, where you take the writing classes, I encourage you to seek out those Christian universities. They are accredited. Those, trans, those credits do transfer. Okay. Now, here's one of the things, the reason why I bring this up is because there again, Solomon is looking at knowledge and wisdom. And he's saying devoid of God, knowledge and wisdom is vain. You're going, you're chasing circles. Look what he says in verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be, be counted. In other words, he says, I see this world is crooked. But wisdom and knowledge devoid of God will not make it straight. We see injustice. We see death. We see sickness. We see disease. We see all these things. Those things are crooked. But not philosophy and, and wisdom and knowledge that is outside of God does not make those things straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. He says these things are lacking and it gives you no firm base in which to go from. In other words, it doesn't answer the questions that you bring up. The more questions, the more knowledge, the more wisdom you have, the less you get answers to if you're seeking out the answers devoid of God. 
there again, uh, I believe that's what we're seeing a lot in the sciences, especially in the philosophy uh, fields in our secular universities. Here's a good uh, film I want you to, to look up and to watch, especially if you have kids, grandkids, or nieces or nephews uh, that are in the, the, the secular school system that are going to look at secular universities. It's a movie called Expelled by Ben Stein. Now, there's another movie called Expelled. This, this is not the one. Look for the one Ben Stein, B E N. S-T-E-I-N, Ben Stein. Uh, ben Stein is a Jew. He's a believing Jew. In other words, he believes in God. He believes the Old Testament. Uh, he believes in, in Jesus, but not as his Savior. He believes in the historical Jesus. He's not offended by Jesus, but he does not have him as his Lord and Savior to, that I'm aware of. Um, but he comes to it from a Judeo-Christian worldview, and his whole movie is about how God has been expelled from our universities. It's kind of a documentary with some humor mixed in there because of the seriousness of the matter. He does bring some humor into it. But he interviews professor after professor after professor who have been expelled from universities, uh, especially in the sciences, for bringing God into their worldview. And so he's kind of exposing these things. Um, and he interviews some of the deepest thinkers, some of the most brilliant minds that we have in the world today that are under the sun. He interviews Richard Dawkins. And here's the thing. He gets to the very basic point. All this wisdom, all this knowledge, all this science, it all boils down to one question. Where does life come from? And that's what Solomon's saying. It all boils down to this one thing. Where does life come from? And so that's the, the bare essence of the question of science. And Richard Dawkins has this to say. He says it comes, he believes, from outer space. He believes it's an alien life form. He says he believes that millions of years ago that aliens were advanced and they brought life and they seeded it on Earth. And from that uh, single-celled amoeba, that's where we get life. And so Richard Dawkins presses him even further. Well, where does that alien life come from? And Richard Dawkins finally admits in this film that he believes that there is an intelligent designer. Now, Richard Dawkins is a stout atheist. He's not agnostic. He doesn't say, well, I don't know if there is a God or not. Oh, he says there, there is most likely an intelligent designer, but there's no way, no way Richard Dawkins is going to admit it's the God of the Bible. There's an intelligent designer that created the first life form, but there must it cannot be the God of the Bible is what Richard Dawkins says. Now then here, uh, Richard Roos is another professor and um, his theory. Uh, well, let me just tell you, let, let me just let you uh, listen to it. I'll, I'll put my phone up here and you can listen to his interview. It's about a one minute clip. Now think of this. Now, as you're listening to this, what is lacking cannot be counted. What is crooked cannot be made straight. And what, is, what does Solomon say? He says, I've come to know madness and folly, and I perceive that all this is a chasing after the wind. Listen to this interview. This As we get from an inorganic world to the world of the cell. Well, one popular theory is that it might have started off on the backs of crystals. My crystal ball. Molecules piggybacked on the back of crystals forming and that this led to more and more complex but of course the nice thing about crystals is every now and then you get mistakes mutations and that this opens the way for natural selection but but at one point there was not a living thing yeah and then there was a living thing how did that happen well this is the i've just told you and i don't see any reason why you shouldn't go from very simple to more and more complex to more and more I don't complex. either. I don't either, but I don't know how you get from mud to a living cell. That's my question. Yes, well, I've told you. I, I think there's on, the back back of of on the backs of crystals. On the backs of crystals is at least one hypothesis, yes. So, so that's your theory, and you think that is more likely and less far-fetched than intelligent design? I think it is. All right. So you hear him getting frustrated, right? I've already told you, on the backs of crystals, that's where life came from. And Ben Stein won't let him go get away with that answer. Well, where does that first life form come? I've already told you, from the backs of crystals. You know, this is, goes back to Romans chapter 1. You don't have to turn there, but Romans chapter 1, verse 21 says this. For although they knew God, there's got to be an intelligent designer. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. That's what Solomon is saying. I'm wise, but me trying to find meaning in, in life devoid of God. 
I became a fool. That's what he says there in, the, in madness and, fool, and folly in verse 17. There's no answer in this. That's why I say, as we look at our, our education process, is we have to go to a process that involves God in the process. Otherwise, it's spinning circles, aliens, crystals. Where, where are you going with that? It has no final answer to it devoid of God. And there again, what is the answer that God gives us? In the beginning, God created, right? That's where wis godly wisdom and education and knowledge will take us is to his word, right? All right. So here we see that uh, this wisdom does not satisfy is what uh, Solomon says. The second reason for his despair is that pleasure doesn't satisfy. Now there again, this is where we need to, to pour into our children and have them understand. Let's learn from Solomon on this, okay? So really he gives us six sources, uh, insufficient sources, excuse me, six insufficient sources of joy and meaning that we see here. The first is laughter. Look what he says in verse two, uh, chapter two. He says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. What was he talking about? This joy, this laughter. He, he brought the best comedians, right? Um, he didn't have to go to, uh, to the comedy clubs. The comedy clubs came to him, right? So make me laugh. Get, show me just laughter. Well, if you do see much comedy, most of it is very vulgar and things like that. And he's like, there, there's, yeah, okay, it, it, it entertained me for a moment. But there's no true meaning in this, in laughter. Now, there again, God is our God. He loves laughter, right? Um, laughter is medicine for the soul, is what Proverbs says. Psalm 126 says, our mil mouths are filled with laughter. God is, a, Jesus is not a killjoy, okay? Uh, he wants us to laugh. Jesus laughed, right? But here's the thing is that when we look at the, what, what brings us joy and laughter are the things that are in God. That's what the fulfilling joy, the fulfilling laughter is when we're together with God. So Solomon is talking about this fleeting superficial joy that might distract us from the pain, but it can't overcome the pain. Okay, So it can't overcome it. So this joy uh, that we have in life, um, and he, he speaks of uh, uh, the, the laughter there. The um, What does he say? Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself, but behold, this was vanity. I said, verse two, I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure, what use is it? There again, it's just a, a fleeting thing, right? Well, the next thing he comes to is uh, look in verse uh, verse three. I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what is good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. So he says, I tried alcohol. Well, the comedy, laughter wasn't the answer. Well, let me try alcohol. Let me see what that does. And so he kind of gives two angles from it. He says, first of all, look at verse three. He says, uh, how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom. So he says, listen, I, I tried the, uh, the, 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 the casual uh, drinking, the uh, the cultural drinking, whatever you want to call it, uh, the you know the the wine clubs and you know the sophisticated type drinking to where you you know the pinky out taking a sip and sniffing the wine and those things. So not drunkenness, but you know a uh, little, little you know uh, drinking here and there, um, casual uh, drinking with my friends, uh, but not drunkenness. I kept my heart of wisdom about me, uh, but that didn't satisfy. Okay, the wine clubs and those things did not satisfy. So what does he say? He goes on in verse three and how to lay hold on folly. Okay, so he goes the opposite direction. Well, maybe I'm not drinking enough. And so he just gets hammered. He starts drinking a lot. He starts having all kinds of excess of drunkenness, of folly, he says. There's no pleasure there either, right? I mean, there's there's only heartache when, when, when that becomes into the picture. And so he says, uh, to, uh, my, see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during their few days of their life. He says, look, I tried alcohol, uh, the, the casual kind and also the hard kind, and neither one of them were fulfilling. So what's the next thing he talks about? His great works. Look at his, He says here in verse four, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. 
I made myself pools for which water and forest to grow trees, right? So uh, the, the wording that is used there, if you look at the wording in the Hebrew, it's actually the same terms and same description as given to the Garden of Eden. So he's saying, I tried to, to recreate the Garden of Eden. So he didn't just have this little backyard little, you know, thing going on where he grew some herbs and, you know, some pretty flowers. No, these are extravagant gardens, extravagant landscapes that he did, extravagant buildings that he built. He says, in all of these things, there must be pleasure. If I build a beautiful enough garden and have the greatest architecture and the great works that I will create, then I will have pleasure. No, nope, there's no pleasure in those things either. So what does he go on to say? Verse seven, I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. So he says, look, in my possessions. So if the great works didn't do anything, maybe my maybe possessions is where the answer is. And so he tries to accumulate wealth. He does accumulate wealth, people, possessions, uh, herds of flocks and different things. If I have more, then I'll be more satisfied. Possessions doesn't do it either. So, so far we got what? We got laughter, we've got uh, alcohol, we've got uh, great works and accomplishments, and we have possessions. So far, none of those things have satisfied. So he gives a fifth one, singers, right? Look at verse eight, go, go uh, back to the second part of verse eight. He says, I got singers, both men and women, right? So he brings in uh, music, right? So he, he doesn't go to concerts, Concerts come to him. So, I mean, if you could just imagine, these are not just people that he finds in the streets that, that he comes in to have as, as singers. No, all over the known world, all the things under heaven, he's brought into his arena in Jerusalem in order to hear. So there again, people in, in our day and time, we go to a Garth Brooks concert or we go to a Rolling Stones concert. Rolling Stones, one of their songs, I can't get no satisfaction, right? I mean, there's, it's in the music. Uh, Lady Gaga or whoever, I don't know how, how, who that is really. But anyway, he doesn't go to those concerts. He brings them to him. And he says, in this, in music entertainment, I was watching TV uh, this past week, and uh, one of the commercials kept coming on was for the VMAs, the Video Music Awards. And, um, and they were previewing some of the people who would be there. I didn't know, but maybe one or two of them, and I don't listen to their music. I just happen to know who they are. And I, as I was watching this, I was like, there, if there's one, uh, if there's a, an opportunity to get a root canal, I'll take that over, over this there. He was, that's just my personal opinion. But anyway, he tries to bring in all these things to try to find meaning and fulfillment in music. And it doesn't happen. It does not take place. There is no meaning in those things in and of themselves. So what does he go on to say? He goes on in verse, uh, verse nine, or excuse me, the last part of verse eight. He says, uh, men and women, he says, and many concubines to delight the souls of men. So even in sex, he tries to find in personal relationships, in sexual relationships, tries to find meaning and purpose. He had over 700 concubines and wives. Uh, technically, if we want to look at it from today's perspective, he had a pornography issue. Uh, and so he th thought, well, maybe in pornography or in sex or these relationships, I will find meaning. They, they didn't fulfill. There was no ultimate joy in those things, right? They all went away. There, uh, there's always uh, the, the after effect, right? Verse 11, he says, Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expanded in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. All of these things I was trying to find pleasure in, there was nothing there. He's trying to find ultimate fulfillment when we know that that only comes in Christ Jesus. It only comes in that relationship. And that's what Solomon is trying to tell us, that devoid of God, all of these things are meaningless. Now, there again, music and sex and possessions and all of these things, God, those are gifts of God that he's given to us. But when we take God out of the picture they become meaningless. They become vanity. They become void of meaning and joy and contentment. So only when we bring God into these things. Now then, if you notice a lot of what uh, what Solomon is saying here is I, me, myself. It's all about me. It's all about uh, pleasing me and, and my pleasure and my satisfaction. And he's looking at things of devoid of God. 
right? Um, you can enjoy God and the pleasures of creation through him in, in reverence to him, but not rightly if you are apart from him. In other words, this world is not all about you. Bringing God into the picture is what he has designed for us to live in relationship with him. Now, the third reason for his despair is uh, is that death is inevitable. He goes on by verse 12. So I return to consider wisdom and madness and folly for what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly and there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that with the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will, hap will happen to me also. Why then have I been, been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this is also vanity. For of the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten, how the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity, a striving after the wind. So he says, look, I'm just, it's all going to be left behind here. We're all going to face death. That's forever, for the wise person and for the fool. And so he's saying we can't avoid death, and everything that you work for will be gone. Uh, if you can't take it with you, right? That's what we what we say. And so he, he's looking at the things of this world and saying, "Look, man, you know, when you, this is the the ultimate end, uh, the ultimate satisfaction you're looking for. It's all going to go away at some point. That, that's that's for everybody, for the rich, for the poor, the wise, the unwise. We all have this certain fate, and it's called death. And there's nothing you can do to avoid it, right? So you work all your life, you save all this money, and you do all these things, and then you die, and it's all gone. It's all forgotten." Right. That's what he's saying. There again, a view of life under the sun. Death is inevitable. So um, going on from there, what do we see here? A solution. He comes to the solution for meaning and joy. And that is this knowing the God of grace and of justice, knowing the God of grace and of justice. Notice what he says here in verse 18. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And verse 19. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will be a master of all which is which I toiled for and use my wisdom under the sun. This is also vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because here's the thing. He says, sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. So there, there again, he's talking about leaving behind all of these things. Well, let's skip down to verse 24. This is where we really get into the joy part, right? So he talks about death and about how all these things are going away. Verse 24, he says, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Ah, there you go. We finally get to the positive. Now he's coming to a view above the sun, right? So he's looked at life under the sun and how it's all vain, how there's no pleasures in life don't find fulfillment. Wisdom does not give you a fulfillment and uh, death is inevitable and all these things are going away. So how do we, how are we to live this life? How do we find joy? How do we find fulfillment? That's what he says in verse 24. Nothing better for a person. He should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Look at it says, this also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, apart from God, what does he say? Who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the busyness of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and striving after the wind. So what is he saying? God is the one who makes the difference. Enjoy God. Enjoy your food and your drink and your work. What is he saying? This is the hand of God. The hand of God denotes the, the grace of God, how God will give us grace, how we can enjoy a meal together with friends or just enjoy a, a meal and the, 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 the deliciousness of food. All right. Not there again, not overeating and not gluttony, but enjoying the, what God God has given to us. So he's talking about the small things. Remember we talked about that. Enjoy God in the small things. He, here with, Solomon went to the ends of the earth, extravagant expense to try to find joy and meaning and happiness. All of this money, all of this travel, all these things that are done. And he says, true joy can be found with God in eating a meal. 
and, and drinking together and having a, having a meal together. Now, obviously, he's not talking about excessive drinking. He's talking about, you know, of course, they drank wine in those days because water was many times not good. And he's just in, in, in eating and drinking and, and the, the work, your work that you have as a, an accountant or a teacher or a plumber or whatever you do. Enjoy God in your work and be grateful and bring God into your work, into your meal, into your free time, into your hobby into whatever it is that you do, whatever you're doing, bring God into that picture and in the small things and the and God will bring enjoyment even in those. Enjoy the little things that God has given. You don't have to have the, the wisdom and the, the, the finances of Solomon in order to have joy and have fulfillment. They're found in Christ, not in the wisdom, not in the money or the possessions. It's found in God himself. Right. And we're to find enjoyment in our work. Uh, we're to be workers. God is a worker. Right. God rejoices in his works is what Psalm 104 says. Uh, God created. He's he is a work. He's created us to work and to find enjoyment in our work. Right. So apart from him, you can't have enjoyment in these things. Right. Um, so this is a life changing statement. You can't have true meaning and joy apart from a relationship with God is what Solomon is saying. Your life is empty. Without God, the God who made us in a relationship with him. Matter of fact, uh, Augustine said this, speaking to God or about God. He says, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Oh, what a powerful statement. Our hearts are restless. Our hearts were made. You made us, God, for yourself. And our hearts are restless until we find our rest in him. That's a very good uh, point that Augustine makes there. Endless enjoyment doesn't come from a new iPhone or from new technology or a new pastime. Those are just fillers trying to, to distract us from the weariness of life. But in Christ, those things have new meaning. Technology has a new meaning of how we can advance the kingdom of God with technology, how we can be together uh, in, in, during a pandemic and enjoy the scriptures together through technology. So technology is not evil. iPhones are not evil, right? Music is not evil, but they're again devoid of God. They can take on a whole nother realm of themselves that is meaningless. It's empty. So that's what he's trying to get to here. So what does he say here? Resting in God's justice. And notice the themes of justice is all throughout uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. And here he says that the sinner and the righteous will be appropriately handled by God. Notice what he says there in verse 26. For the one who pleases him, pleases God, God gives him wisdom and knowledge and joy. God wants you to have wisdom and knowledge and joy in that relationship with him. He says, but to the sinner, those devoid of God, he's given the busyness of gathering and collecting. He says, it's just a busyness of gathering and collecting, gathering more information, gathering more toys, gathering more wealth, gathering more whatever, and just gathering and collecting, which is just an endless cycle of weariness and of vanity. It's like chasing the wind. It's like herding cats. There's no, you're not going to find meaning and fulfillment and joy in those things. And what does he end with here? He says, only, only to give to the one whom God pleases. And that's where we see um, the, where Jesus says the righteous, or excuse me, the meek will inherit the earth. In other words, those without God, all the efforts they put into the things of this life, it all goes away. But who's left? The people of God. They're the ones who inherit the earth, inherit the riches of God's presence, the riches of an eternal life, of a new heaven and a new earth. And so therefore, what we're working for today in Christ is not just gone away at death. No, there's an afterlife. We're building, we're storing up riches uh, for the future. Matter of fact, it talks about that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. Listen to what Paul says. He says, as for the rich in this present age, the rich right now without devoid of God, uh, he says, to, or excuse me, to the rich of this present age, those who have, have abundance, charge them or challenge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. So he's saying, listen, if you do have wealthy people in your church, in your congregation, encourage them, charge them, challenge them not to be haughty or to look at the things of this world as theirs and as, the, as, as this is fulfillment, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. 
They are to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. In other words, seeing what God has given you is not your own, but is to be stewards of what God has given you. To do what? To advance his kingdom, to help the poor, to help those, to, 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 to use that for God's purpose, whatever that purpose is. Verse 19, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. There again, do we see everything as, as temporary, that we're just going to die, so I need to use up all I can while I have it, because when I die, it's going to someone else. Or this world is all we have, so just live it up while you're here. Are you seeing the, what God has given you, the life God has given you, and the possessions, and the finances, and the family, and the friends, and all the things God has given you as a down payment on the future glory, right? Using them for God's glory. So that, listen to this. We read verse 19 again, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Boy, there's a huge answer to one of the big questions. What is truly life? We see, we see that trying to be answered in music and in alcohol and in sex and different, a lot of different things in this world. We're looking for what is truly life. And Paul says it right here. He says, living for God, that is what is truly life. Take hold of that which is truly life. Uh, there again, I want to speak to the, the, the younger generation for just a moment. And, uh, and, and I'm going to kind of speak outside of my realm of understanding a little bit, right? Um, there's this thing called Pokemon, Pokemon Go. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Pokemon Go. I don't know much about it. I know a little bit about it, right? You take your, your device, your phone or whatever, and you look out and uh, you go out into the real world. That's what uh, one of the advertisements says, have an adventure, in the real world. So you take your device outside along the streets and the, wherever, and you have this device and you look through it. And as you're looking through uh, your device, these Pokemon figures pop up and you can claim them. And that get, does certain things within the game, right? I don't understand the game completely, but the whole point is to go out into real life and find these Pokemon creatures. In other words, it sends you out on an adventure to look for hidden things that you can't see without your device, with that app that's downloaded, right? And so th here's the reality of life as a Christian. Life that is pleasing unto God and a life for God is not going to a monastery and giving up all worldly possessions and going and chanting Proverbs all day long. That's not what God is and what Paul is talking about of taking hold of that which is truly life. What Paul is saying here is it's like Pokemon Go, okay? There's a whole world of adventure out there, but it's hidden. You've got to find it. It's an adventure to see where God has pleasures hidden all over the place. It's in your work. It's in your school. It's in your relationships. It's, it's in all these things that God has, the, the small things, remember? It's in these things where you can find pleasure as you're looking through, not your device, but you're looking through a life that is filtered through God and his word. You find this adventure of finding God in the small places as a scientist in discoveries, as a, as a, uh, whatever you do in your life, you're going to find God in small things. And when you find those, then you're going to be able to experience those and find meaning and fulfillment and pleasure. Now, here's the thing. Some of you may be totally lost when I talk about Pokemon Go. You have no idea what I'm talking about. How can you, where are these things at? How can you find it? How can you have pleasure in that? How does that give you meaning and fulfillment? Well, here's the thing. is just like it's hard to explain Pokemon Go to someone. It's hard to explain until you experience it, what it is to go out and find that adventure that is in Christ Jesus, right? To find those things where God has given us an opportunity to see him, to experience him in the small things that are in this life. But they're out there. They're out there. But you've got to be looking for them through the lens of God in his word, in that relationship with Jesus Christ. So let's uh, look as we look at Solomon's life and we say, hey, a life that is devoid of God, it is vanity. It's meaningless. But when you bring God into the picture, all of these things can hold the pleasures of God that he blesses us with in music, in relationships, in, pos in possessions, in laughter, in all of these things that we can find meaning and purpose in the pleasures and joy that is found in a relationship with God.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, your word. And Lord, may we draw close to you. Lord, may we seek to, to live this life in close relationship with you in every part of our life. Lord, that we may not try to seek joy and meaning outside of that relationship. Lord, that we would live within the parameters that you've given to us. And Father, that we would find you and find joy in you in the small things. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, I hope this has been a blessing. And until next time, may God bless.